So I just want to take some time today to share a little bit about who we are, how God's moved us around the globe a bit, and then also just take some time to share some things that God's been teaching and growing me in in the area of how to share our faith and uh, starting gospel conversations with those around us that God brings into our lives. So, so hopefully some helpful things that, uh, uh, that you can be applying to your life as you uh, seek to be ambassadors for Christ. So this is us as we arrived in South Africa 2007 when our, we had uh, two of our daughters then. And uh, we started off with an AIDS hospice care home. And my wife's a nurse. And um, so we had the goal of showing compassion and sharing the gospel. And so it was just a small four-bed hospice care home for end-stage hospice patients. Heather trained the caregivers, and I worked as a, a chaplain slash ambulance driver slash whatever else needed fixed and, and things like that. A few years later, uh, the needs changed in the area, and so we ended up closing the care home and then switched to do pastoral training for Zulu pastors. And did that for a few years and also worked with the missionaries in the area as a team leader. And um, this is half of this was our team in the Durban, er, South Africa area. And we were living in Richards Bay, about two hours north of Durban on the Indian Ocean coast. Uh, about nine years ago, uh, our mission asked us to go to move up to Tanzania to serve as a regional director for East Africa. And so our family tr transitioned up there nine years ago. To, uh, t we lived in Tanzania and served the East Africa region. And this is on a survey trip to in Uganda, serving there uh, to help the missionaries find a place to serve. And uh, so this is on the, on the Nile River there. And enjoyed being able to, to build into the missionaries there in about four different countries. And then six years, and we also uh, were able to serve, one of the countries there was uh, South Sudan. So this is up in South Sudan. Their worship service was under a tree. And so everyone like jumped up and down for like an hour. That's how they do their worship service. Maybe that's afterwards. I don't know. It's uh, maybe this, this kid's week this week. Um, but it's very different there. And, but we enjoyed being able to build into the missionaries in those areas. Yeah, six years ago, uh, God led us to move to Portugal and serve as the Western Europe Regional Director. And so we've been uh, living in Portugal and serving the missionaries in Western Europe. And it's just a real joy for us to be able to multiply ourselves and see the gospel spread as we build into the missionaries there. Our family's changed a little bit since, our, since 17 years ago, but um, uh, it's just been a real joy to be able to serve with our family uh, over the years. Our oldest daughter, Abby, got married last year to a great guy named Connor, and they just moved up here to Minneapolis uh, in June, and so they're getting settled in here. And um, our middle daughter, Emily, is a junior at Cedarville University and studying elementary education and special education, and uh, spent her year, or spent her summer down in uh, Kentucky with a, at a dyslexia camp where they uh, tutor dyslexic students. And then our youngest daughter, Natalie, is our, uh, our, travel, uh, our travel companion now, so we have to try to stay cool for her. And, uh, and uh, she's in ninth, ninth grade, and she, uh, she takes Krav Maga, enjoys surfing, and uh, does, has fun with her kids that are friends in Portugal. And the girls have all attended a Christian school in Portugal that our mission runs for MK students. And... Um, if anyone is ever interested in teaching overseas, come talk to us afterwards. We're always in need of teachers, and we provide housing and a car for the first uh, couple years. And so uh, even if someone wanted to come for a semester sometimes, we have, sometimes we have holes that we need people to come and fill in there. So that's always a, a great need there. And we also have opportunities for even for retired people that want to come over for like a month or two and do like yard work and general maintenance stuff. We have a place for you to stay. You can kind of do four hours of work in the morning and then go sightsee in the afternoon. So that's an opportunity as well. And if you're younger and you want to make a little mental note of that, it's a good vacation spot for when you're retired. <laughs> um, so we've lived in Portugal six years, very different than it was in Africa. Uh, we enjoy every place that God's moved to us. Uh, you kind of have to reinvent yourself as a family. Uh, I, don't, I don't go to the game park anymore like I did in South Africa. Um, you know, I have to hike with my Rambo knife anymore because there's not like leopards and, uh, and 16 foot uh, pythons that are going to come after us anymore. So it's, it's beautiful there in Portugal and uh, enjoyed some of the palaces, some of the hiking, uh, the gorgeous coast coastlines that uh, along the 
along the Atlantic there, castles that are interesting to go visit. And uh, so we've enjoyed some of those things as a family. We live right in the city of Lisbon. And uh, so now we've moved from a house into an apartment. Uh, so that's a little bit adjustment there uh, where we live. And, uh, but it's always a, it's a beautiful place and they, have, they do have very good gelato. So that's, if you're ever in, in coming through there, that's an important uh, to-do list. We really enjoy our church family there. We have an um, international church that we attend that has an English and a Portuguese service. And so it's a, a small church plant, and uh, we're, we're in this stage where we've kind of run out of room. So a lot of days, we're actually like outside on the sidewalk, <laughs> kind of looking through the door. So we're praying that God will help uh, the church raise some funds and find a, a place for our church to be able to grow into. So it's one of those good problems to have. Uh, but we enjoy building into the people that come to visits and um, with other expats that are coming and uh, just see, neat seeing what God's doing there. In the role of regional director, uh, Heather and my, my wife and I get to serve as a team, and our main goal is expanding the gospel's reach. And the focus that we really focus on as we do that is equipping and encouraging missionaries. Uh, the average time that a missionary spends on the field is only about four years. So when you take, that's a, a, like a national average between all mission agencies. And about, I haven't updated it. This is actually supposed to be 50% of missionaries return to the USA on their first term of, uh, for preventable reasons. So things like conflict uh, or team conflict, marital issues, uh, child-related issues, and unmet expectations. So 50% of the people. So you imagine that it takes you know, two, uh, one, to, one to three years to get to the mission field. And you get to the mission field, and it takes two to three years to learn the language. And if people are coming home in the first four to five years, that's not a lot of time that they're actually able to invest in spreading the gospel. And so our goal is to do whatever we can to keep missionaries on the field, um, spiritually healthy and thriving in ministry. And so as we, get, as we do that, the work of the gospel can be able to f flourish in that way. Paul challenges us in Ephesians 4.12 to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And so just a few of the different ways that we work to equip others. The first is strategic planning. And we work with teams and uh, team leaders to help develop a ministry strategy and evaluate where's the best place to be starting new ministries. And just to pray through those things with them and to evaluate how can we best see the gospel move forward? And are we using our time in the best way? The next area is developing leaders. And uh, each, each year we have a few days of in-person meetings where our team leaders come together and we'll have um, all of the team leaders and wives together from around Western Europe and just spend some time grow, thinking through and praying through and, and studying how we can be growing and developing as leaders. We also spend time each month uh, having calls with them, and we'll talk through you know, what current problems they're facing, uh, what current challenges they're facing, uh, how can we be overcoming those, and also how can we be growing as leaders. And as these leaders grow, they're able to better lead their teams. I remember when we moved from East Africa up to Western Europe, and our number of missionaries went from like 20 up to over 100 at that point, and... Um, being reminded of Jethro in the Bible, Moses' uh, Moses's father-in-law, when he said, you know, Moses, it's not good that you try to do all this alone. You need to be investing in other people. And so that's really been our goal as we've moved up into this role, knowing that there's no way I can keep up with all this. We need to be investing in these leaders and seeing God use them and build them up, grow them up to be able to build into their teams. The next thing is mentoring and coaching. And so we do a lot of mentoring and coaching with our missionaries and also with the team leaders. Usually this is over Zoom, and uh, we'll have calls to just talk through the challenges they're facing, how they want to be growing as a, as a, in their spiritual life, and, and also as leaders. The, th the next area is mobilizing new missionaries. And so we get to be a part of the process from vetting new missionaries when they first reach out to our mission agency to when the time they get to the field, we'll work that process with them to talk through, hey, where would be a, the best place for you to fit in in ministry? Where's going to be a, a good team for you to fit in? 
and also to be able to make sure that they are going to be a good fit for the team. Because, as I mentioned before, one of those um, preventable reasons is team conflict. So we don't want to get, send the wrong person over to the field. That's going to cause a lot of conflict there. And so we do spend a lot of our time working with these uh, potential missionaries to see if they're going to be a good fit for the mission field. It's been fun for us also to be visiting college campuses and challenging students to consider missions. And uh, it's been neat to see some that have uh, come on uh, trips or that we've been able to encourage that are now taking those next steps towards missions as well. And then lastly, creating resources. Uh, we've recently launched a podcast called Missions Life, Navigating Life, Leadership, and Ministry Abroad. And uh, this is just a free resource for missionaries from any organization, wherever, um, that just helps them to think through some different ways that, uh, that they can be, or some different resources they can use to be equipping them for the mission field and just to encourage them. It's also for churches and people considering missions as well. And so that's been fun for Heather and I to be able to start interviewing people for that and, uh, and sharing that as well. I also enjoy writing blogs and books to help our missionaries and encourage them. Uh, one of the, uh, my first, my book is out on the table there if you'd like to check, take a look at that. And uh, today I'll be sharing a little bit, a uh, little section from the book uh, with you this morning as well. And so this has been fun for us to create resources that help encourage missionaries or equip missionaries. The second part is encouraging. And a few different ways that we, uh, we work on that. Um, in Acts 14, 22, it Paul says that he goes around, he went around to the churches, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. And so just a few different ways that we encourage others is taking time to visit them. Uh, missionaries love to show us where they live and where they minister. And uh, it may seem like a small thing, but it can be really hugely impactful as well. This April, I was able to visit some of the missionaries in Italy that hadn't had someone visit them yet and take time to see where their church was, and he went and showed us around. And no one from our mission agency had been able to visit them yet, uh, and they've been with us about, I think, eight or, eight or ten years. Um, I was supposed to go four years ago. Something happened. I can't remember what it was. Um, but uh, just to visit them and just to encourage them. And we remember when we were in South Africa, when our team leader came, and he was the first person to come out and visit with, drive through the townships with us. And... Uh, so he said, you know, you guys are doing a good job. And our daughter, our oldest daughter, was in the back at the, at the time. She was probably like six or something like that. And she came up to us afterwards. She's like, does Uncle Bobby think we're doing a good job? And we always remembered that, that not only do parents need to be reminded of that they're doing a good job, but also the kids need to hear that because they've also left everything and come and ministering together as a family. And... We all know that our work in the Lord is, is never in vain, but it's good to be reminded of that, and we get to be the people that remind them of that. And so that's just a real joy for us to do that. Debriefing is another part of our role, and this spring we were able to visit some of the new missionaries in Ireland and stay with their home for a couple of days and just talk through, hey, what's going well? Uh, what are some things that maybe you're facing with cultural, culture shock? Um, what are the struggles? What are the, how are your kids doing through this transition? And talking through those things in, a, in a, just a casual way in people's homes in a debriefing manner uh, allows them to share you know, the things that they're, that they're feeling. And it allows for expectations to be clarified. Because if we have unmet expectations of, hey, as soon as I hit the field and, and go, through all these, go through all these things, we're going to have a church, and then it's going to be easy. Well, it's not going to go that way usually. And so to be able to talk through that with them really helps to set clear expectations and help them to have a good, clear perspective on how to face the challenges that come. Conflict resolution is another part of our role. Now, this picture is actually a healthy team. Everyone's smiling in the picture. If it wasn't, uh, they probably would not be smiling. Um, when there's conflict on teams, uh, things don't go well. People leave. And um, so part of our role is to help work with teams to help work through different conflicts and, re and resolve those. And this is the not fun part of our job. And if you uh, get on our prayer letter list, you're not going to see these, these written about in our prayer letters. Um, but it is part of our role. And 
these are one of those preventable reasons that take people off the field. And so um, if we just leave problems, they just keep getting bigger. Uh, if you've ever remember that, that old veggie tales where the, the rumor weed keeps growing and growing and growing, well, that's, that's where conflicts happen. Uh, if you just leave them alone, they just keep growing and growing. And uh, so our role is to help work with that. And recently a missionary came to me with some concerns and I had to have one of those uncomfortable conversations with someone. And uh, a couple months later, though, I got a text back in, from him and it said, hey, you know, uh, I just want to let you know that since your conversation with the other missionary, they've been great to talk to and their attitude and demeanor is wonderful. So as uncomfortable as that part of our job is, missionary that was considering leaving is now staying. And so we're just a good reminder of the importance of that part of our role. Organizing conferences is another part of what we get to do. And we've heard over and over again, we had a last regional conference in November, that just how encouraging that time was for the missionaries. And it's an opportunity for them to be encouraged from the word, to, uh, to have fellowship with other missionaries, and just to relax and have a good time as well. And so we're, we plan one of those, uh, a regional conference every three years, and so we're, we're working on our next one already, getting those planned. Some people ask us, why Europe? Why send missionaries to Europe? Didn't the Reformation happen there? And uh, it's true that it, that it did, but um, there's a huge, huge need for the gospel there. Interesting fact, though, I did learn that the Reformation never made it to the Iberian Peninsula, so Portugal, Spain, and even into Italy. The, the Reformation never really hit there, uh, where, those, where the Catholic strongholds are. But percentage of evangelical Christians, uh, these are the countries that we work in. Ireland, Spain, France, and Italy all have less than 1% evangelical Christian. Portugal has about 3%. Germany has 2%. And Scotland and England have less than 3% that attend any kind of church regularly. And so even over the last few years, we've also seen like a rise in Wicca, Satanism, a lot of old cults. Uh, People are searching for answers, and Europe needs the gospel. We oversee about 90 missionaries in uh, eight countries, uh, Portugal, Spain, France, Germany, Italy, England, Ireland, and Scotland. And just some, some ways you can be specifically praying. Uh, first, pray that God will give us wisdom to lead well. Uh, we need guidance to be able to, uh, to make good decisions each day. Uh, working through conflict things, we need wisdom on how to be able to do that well. Another is for more missionaries. Uh, sharing the gospel in Europe can be a really slow process. Uh, it takes a lot of time sometimes to build relationships with people and to allow them to get to the point where they'll listen to you as you talk to them. And uh, if God's been laying on your heart to, uh, to be thinking about praying about missions, we'd love to talk to you afterwards and uh, be able to share some opportunities for you to take a next step or some ways you can be praying about that. And then also, uh, we're needing to raise some extra support. This January, our health insurance is going to go up, and our mission's also going to be adjusting for our lovely inflation that's happening. Um, so we're going to need to raise about 300 uh, starting in January. And so just be praying for God's provision on that. And uh, if you'd like to uh, get some information about how to get involved, we have a sign-up for our prayer letter list for emails or prayer cards, and then some also information back there on how to give if the Lord leads you that way or how to go. Um, all of that back there. And then if, if you're really interested in, in matching some countries, trying to test your geography knowledge, there is a matching game there that you can try to match the countries with the object back there. So, so you see if you can get that. As our missionaries in Western Europe uh, expand the gospel's reach, they're, they're like an oasis in a desert. And this morning I'm going to be challenging you with some things that God's been challenging myself with and how we can each be like an oasis in a desert. So an oasis, an oasis is an area, like you know, it's an area in the desert that provides water. And that's what our life as Christians is like when we're filled to overflowing. We're like an oasis in a desert. And we all have the, the life-giving water of God as Christians to share with those around us. And all around us, people are dying of spiritual thirst. Uh, they're lost, but most of them don't even realize that they are lost. And the world is like a desert. 
Uh, the souls of so many people are pursuing their satisfaction in what the world has to offer, but they're not going to find it there, are they? It never delivers. And so for us, if we want to be like an oasis in a desert, three things need to, we need to focus on three different things. And so we'll look at each of these today. The first is who we are, and the second is connecting, and the third is sharing hope. So the first one, who we are. We must stay connected to God. We must stay connected to God. The only thing that we have to offer other people is what Christ has flowed through us. And we can't minister from an empty stream. Jesus said in John 15, 5, Apart from me, you can do nothing. So when our life is connected to God, His life-giving waters flow through us to other people. And this is where our strength to minister to other people comes from. It comes from God. He gives it to us and it flows through us. So just like if you think about an oasis, what would happen if you were to cut off that oasis from the source of the water, the, the, the spring, the underground spring that's feeding it? It's going to dry up. And the same thing is true of us. If we do not stay daily connected to Christ, we dry up. So what connects us to our source of life and power? Isaiah 40, 31 says, They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. So what does it mean to wait for the Lord? Well, first is it means being still. Um, it says in Psalm 46, 10, Be still and know that I am God. When you think about our quiet time, our devotional time, do we take time to be still, not just in our body, but also in our mind, to, to quiet our hearts, to be still, and to consider the great things of God? Our, act, our default is usually doing, not being still. And so we oftentimes try to find our strength and our busyness and our activity instead of taking time to be still. And Jesus gave us an example of this. In, John, in Luke 5.16, says he would withdraw to desolate places to pray. So taking time to be still. In our quiet time, we need to quiet our hearts. And when we do that, what do we need to do? We worship. As we were talking about this morning and just thinking about the greatness of God, who God is. Be still and know that I am God. So when we take time to be still... We take time to worship, to worship Him for who He is and His greatness. And here's how waiting on God and worshiping Him affects us. When we meditate on His greatness and His power, we're reminded that He holds everything in His hands. We don't have to worry. And so it reminds us that the burdens that we're trying to carry around, He's meant to carry those. And we're able to take those burdens and pass them off to Him because He's the one that wants to carry those burdens for us. And this is how our strength is renewed. We stop carrying burdens that we weren't meant to carry, and we pass them off to Him to allow Him to carry them for us. And so who we are, our peace and our strength, becomes like an oasis then for spiritually thirsty people. One of the stories I wanted to share from Western Europe is from Spain. And um, Spain has all the same problems that other countries in Western Europe have. Uh, people are untrusting of churches, and Christians. And because of this, they're really hesitant to go to church or to talk to someone about God. And the Byerleys are missionaries there who really wanted to create a safe space for people to have conversations about God. And uh, so they opened a coffee shop. And uh, when we visited them, it was absolutely packed in there. They have, it is filled up every day. And uh, each, e each evening, of the, or most evenings of the week, they have a conversational English classes for people, and the last couple lessons are topics of God and spirituality. And so they're having opportunities to not only talk to people throughout the day, but also in the evenings, people are signing up for these classes and coming and having conversations with them. And it's just been neat to see how God's using that to get His Word out to people. And they're having conversations with people that they've passed on the streets for years, but until they created this safe place for people to come, they hadn't had the opportunity to actually engage them in these conversations. They didn't want, the other people didn't want to. 
They're also located near a women's uh, soccer stadium, and one of the players had been coming in there, and this player had been struggling with uh, anxiety and depression, and I was talking to her counselor, and the, and the counselor said, well, is there anything that helps? And the, and the lady said, well, there's this one coffee shop I go. I just feel so much peace there when I go. And she's like, well, you should probably keep going. <laughs> and uh, so as she's going there, um, she's able to have conversations with the buyer ladies. And, the, and what was interesting, though, is that the buyer ladies' disposition, who they were, was what she noticed was different. There was just something different about them. And it really starts with who we are. Uh, people need to see a difference in our life. That was what was allowed them to be able to share with her. And so the question for us in our lives is, are we taking time to be still with the Lord in worship, and is His peace filling our life so other people see a difference in us? If we're just as frazzled and worried about everything else that they are, are they going to have a reason to ask us for the hope that is in us? They need to see a difference in our lives. The second area is connecting. We need to be connecting with people. Uh, to be able to have an impact in lives, we need to be having relationships with unbelievers. Luke 7.34 says that Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And uh, I, don't know if you, I don't know if you've noticed this very much here, but especially in Western Europe, unbelievers aren't coming to church to hear about God. More and more people don't see the church as the answer. And... Um, so, and also in Europe, people are very um, culturally, it's very culturally awkward for them to come into a church service. And so how do we, the question is, how do we connect with people? And one of the best ways is connecting with them outside the church walls. You go to them. Uh, one, this is a picture here is one of our church planners in Portugal. He's just retired, but they retired to Portugal. And he's a, he's a runner. Uh, and he's run, I think, at least 80 marathons. I'm not saying you have to do that. Uh, but um, Doug always does what he loves to do with unbelievers. And one day he met a guy that, when this guy found out Doug was a, was a pastor, the guy was like, eh, I really don't want to talk to you. But then when he found out Doug was a runner, they had a nice conversation. About a month later, they were in the same uh, race together, and so for the first 40 minutes, Doug ran alongside him and shared the gospel with him. One of the things Doug challenges his church with is find your tribe. And what he means by that is find the thing you enjoy doing and then go do it with unbelievers. And as they do that, they're having opportunities just to have natural conversations that as they're hanging out with people that lead into gospel conversations. And so that's a great way to be able to do that. The third area is sharing hope. Romans 10, 13 to 14 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Unbelievers are desperately seeking satisfaction and joy, and they're, they're pursuing it wherever they can find it. If you think back to the illustration we started with, with um, if we're like an oasis, this world is like a desert. And in this world of a desert, sin is like a mirage. When you think about a mirage, how it tricks people into thinking there's something of substance there. And they'll go after that, and they'll get there, and what do you get? A mouthful of sand. And that's what people are doing day after day. They're pursuing after, whether it be sin, or whether it be just the things the world has to offer. You know, a good job, their, fam their family succeeding, um, popularity, whatever it is. But they're pursuing these things that aren't going to satisfy, and they're just a mirage. And sometimes when we look at people, we think that they're satisfied because we see them in the midst of their pursuit. So they're, they're looking at that mirage, and so they think they're going to be happy. So they look pretty happy. Uh, but we often don't see them when they catch that mouthful of sand. And many times, though, that's when God breaks in. Uh, when they get that mouthful of sand, and then they realize, this isn't going to satisfy me. So our role, though, is to be planting those seeds along the way. God can break in at any point, but it, he often breaks in when they've hit rock bottom. And that's when they realize, oh, wait, there was this person that had talked to me about something. And then they're open to, to listening to and 
praying through and thinking about their need for the gospel. Uh, one of our missionaries who asked to remain anonymous uh, has had a lot of conversations with an individual over the past eight to nine years, and this individual was part of the LGBTQ plus community involved in uh, pagan spirituality, uh, was uh, involved in feminine goddess worship, angel and spirit worship, all kinds of things. And she'd been searching for many years, and this missionary had been able to have a lot of conversations with her, um, non-judgmental but gospel conversations. And in January, this last January, she came and said, hey, you know what, I came to, came to faith in Christ. I'm part of a church now. I was recently baptized. And she just wanted to thank this missionary for having these conversations with her, just the non-judgmental conversations that never um, endorsed the sin, but shared the truth of the gospel with her. And that's just a good reminder of the fact that to believe, people need to hear. Like our life is so important. It's, it's what may give us the opportunity to speak, but people need to hear the message of the gospel as well. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 says, I planted Apollos watered, but God caused, causes the growth. And you or I may not be able to, in one conversation, be able to share the whole gospel message with someone. Um, but we may be able to help people take one step closer to Christ. There was a quote that said, uh, we're not called to bring all persons to Christ, but to bring Christ to all persons. And that's where God sends us out into the desert to be able to share that with others. So I wanted to share a few other principles here that I found helpful uh, in starting gospel conversations. Um, sometimes it can be awkward to go from, hi, my name is Kyle, to uh, um, God says you're going to hell. And so there's this, there's this gap there um, that we need to be able to help transition that to be able to, to, be able to share truth with people. Because um, you know, if you know how to share the gospel, that's really, really good, but you need to be able to get to that point where people are actually listening to you. If we're just monologuing and they're not really listening, it's not super helpful. So how do we start those conversations? Here's just a few things I found helpful over the years that picked up from different people. Uh, one is just to love others by asking open questions about the other person. It says in Philippians 2.4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And so in our really, really busy world, one of the best ways we can show love to other people is just ask questions. It's really simple. Uh, but asking questions and then just really listening to their story, getting to know them for who they are. And one of the best ways is to, to listen is just staying curious, uh, asking curious questions to see, to ask more about what they've shared. And if you haven't figured this out yet, people do love to talk about themselves. So just give them that opportunity to do so. And as they do that, though, they're often going to mention the things that they love, the things that they value, the things that they believe. Um, and these are all opportunities to be able to have open doors for the gospel. Um, so just asking open questions, though, is, is a question you can ask that doesn't have a yes or no answer. So what made you want to become a blank? Or why do you enjoy that? Uh, just giving them that opportunity. Proverbs 20, verse 5 says, The purposes in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. And so asking people about their beliefs, um, their, uh, their, what, they, what they value, it, it helps to surface some uncertainties in their life, expose false beliefs, and often it just takes a couple questions to be able to get people talking and, and sharing what they believe and what they hold dear. The next is look for and pray for opportunities to plant, or open doors to plant gospel seeds. Colossians 4, 3 through 6 says, Pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So as we talk with people, Notice opportunities for deeper spiritual conversations. Um, just looking for things that they've mentioned that you could ask a question about or to, or to talk to them more about that. And so some helpful ways to bring God into the conversation is to mention God, prayer, and the Bible uh, in your conversations. 
It says in Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And as God's filling our hearts and changing our lives, that's, that can be part of what we talk about. Just making God a part of what we talk about in our stories. You know, if God was part of the story in your life, mention it in the, in the story, how he was a part of that. And that can be a seed that God uses in their life. Another way is to use the phrase, hey, you know what you said reminded me of a place in the Bible where it says this. Uh, and if you have it memorized, you can share the passage. If you have an idea of it, you can paraphrase it. Uh, but what that does is it brings God's word into the conversation. It's uh, and Psalm 119.11, I've stored up your word in my heart. If we have God's word, we can be able to bring that into the conversation. But God's word unlike our words, are alive and active. Uh, Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. As we bring God's word into the conversation, his word can continue to work in their hearts long after we're gone and to be able to change hearts and lives. Another way is this. You can say, you know what, I take time to pray every day is there anything I can be praying for you about? And we, we have neighbors of ours that are atheists. I've been able to use this with them. And even atheists are like, oh, yeah, you can pray for this and this. They're, they're willing to be able to ask for a prayer for that. A couple of different ways that's really beneficial for follow-up is that every month or so I can check back with them and say, hey, you know what? I've been praying for this. How is that going? And so it helps you to jump right back into a conversation that has God in them part, as part of it. It also allows you to show care and concern and love to them. And it also opens the door for God to be able to answer that prayer and to get them to start thinking, well, maybe there is a God. And so we never know how God's going to use that. Another is a question you can use is, many people consider themselves on a spiritual journey. How about you? Where are you at on that journey? And then just listen. Let them share. And many times after they've been able to share, they'll ask you to be able to share, well, you know, how is that different from what you believe? And the first time I used this, the guy's like, yeah, I used to be, but I'm not anymore. And so I was kind of stumped. <laughs> um, and so then I prayed about it and thought about it. And then the next time that came up, um, responded with, well, what happened that caused that to change? And so then, I, then the guy was like, oh, well, this changed and this changed. And so then he was able to share using that. If they say no, you can say, you know, I'd be curious to hear why, if you'd be willing to share, and just give them the opportunity to share. If they say, I'm an atheist or a Muslim or fill in the blank, uh, you can say, with, well, how did you become a blank, or what led you to become a blank? A lot of times, people have never really thought about it. And so just asking the question, not in, a, not in an accusatory way, uh, but just as a curious question, it... A lot of times they'll be like, you know, I never thought about that. I, I'm going to have to go think about that. Your question can be very, very helpful in getting them to think about their spiritual life and where they're headed. And they may never even thought about it. And if they say they don't want to talk, you can say, you know what? If you'd ever like to, I'd always be more than happy to talk with you. Uh, just, just, I'm, just, my door is always open. Uh, just, I won't, um, would love to be able to share with you and, and listen to hear what God's done in your life. All these things can be open doors to deeper gospel conversations, and we never know what God's going to do through those. And so if we want our life to be like an oasis to the lost, uh, we need to be sharing that life-giving message with others. So the three things just to focus on, folks, is the first is who we are. Our life is the biggest message. People need to see that there's a difference in us. The second is to focus on connecting, to be a friend of sinners. Uh, we need to be in the world, but not of the world. And third, to be sharing hope. Uh, be praying for and looking for those opportunities to start gospel conversations. So if you'd like to, if you didn't catch some of those, you wanted to uh, refresh yourself on that, this, um, a lot of these ones are on, a, I did a blog uh, on, our, on our website called Starting Gospel Conversations. So if you go to our website and go to the blog, that's on there. And it's also in the book there as well. And uh, this is just a, we're called to be making disciples. And um, if we desire to see God glorified, 
through our lives, we need to be making disciples. We need to be speaking the message. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And this is a command not just for missionaries, not just for pastors, but for all disciples of Jesus Christ. We're called to multiply, to make more disciples. And people need the life-giving water of God. If you remember, Jesus shared the story of the talents, where he gave, or the master gave to his different servants five talents, two talents, and one talent. And the two of them went and invested it. And they received the well done, good and faithful servant. And in our life, the thing that God's entrusted us with is the gospel. We either need to be investing it, and that's how we're going to receive the well done. But if we bury it, we're not going to receive a well done for that. So I just encourage you and challenge you that God has entrusted you with the gospel. And he wants you to be investing that in the lives of others. And that's how that's going to multiply. And that's how we receive the well done. How can your life be an oasis to the lost? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for what a good God you are. We thank you that you have given us your Son as uh, the satisfaction for our sins to bring us salvation, and we thank you for that so much. We pray that you would help us to, uh, to be faithful to share the message uh, of the gospel with others, Lord, and that you would be opening doors for that to, to spread, that you would be working the hearts and lives of people, that you would help us to love others as you have loved us, and that that would be changing hearts and lives uh, to be bringing them to you, Lord. And we just want to pray these things in the name of your Son. Amen.